Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Uh, Looking forward to an edifying and enlightening conversation. Rocky Gutierrez is our guest. Rocky is the former professor at University of Minnesota. Gordon Gullion Endowed Chair is where he resided when he was teaching everybody over there all about game birds and others as well but mainly game birds. So I'm looking forward to focusing a little bit on the quails, and in particular my passion these days, valley quail. But we'll cover a whole lot of other ground that you might find of interest no matter where you live and what you hunt. We're going to cover everything from hunting in foreign countries and what's out there to the strategies and tactics we might use if we're chasing mountain quail or valley quail. It's all coming up right here on the Upland Nation podcast. Your two cents worth this time around. I'm asking if you offer your dog any kind of energy snacks during a hunt. I think you'll appreciate some of the suggestions we have. And then we're going to Sin City for quail. So uh, in our public access suggestion, I'm going to tell you what I know about uh, Gamble's quail in particular near Las Vegas. Been a fascinating week. I finally got out to the range and did some more practice. Thank you, Vandy and uh, Dave Fiedler for your instruction recently. I've been doing my best to practice what you taught me. Shot 100 rounds on Sunday and uh, hey, not bad. The whole idea is move, mount, shoot. What I'm working on is extending that move, taking a little bit more time before I bring the gun up to my cheek and pull the trigger. Slow down and move. Those hard crossers that used to be so tough for a cross-dominant guy like me, much easier. Thank you, Dave, Vandy, and thank you, Tom, and Chris, by the way, for pulling all this together. On your end, I'm getting a lot of questions about travel this uh, time of year. Everybody's looking at their big trip of the year and where to go and why to go there. Fascinating what I'm hearing about where you're wanting to go, and some of you have already got your plans laid. Lots of family groups, lots of... I talked with somebody a couple days ago about a group that meets in winter South Dakota every year. It's now up to 22 people, and that's before those people start bringing their people now. Yeah, they're going to have to take out a new zip code over there near winter. That's that's probably the entire population of winter times, too. Wherever you're going, be safe out there, and if you're still looking for ideas, of course, i got some suggestions for you at findbirdhuntingspots.com. Be safe. The Upland Nation podcast is made possible by Roughland Performance Kennels, Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Pointer Shotguns, Mid-Valley Clays, and Shooting School, Ringneck Nation of Huron, South Dakota, and True Lock Choke Tubes. Well, if you look at the map, and it's the right kind of map, you know that most of Nevada is, well, it's, I'd say almost all of it is owned by federal and state agencies. Nobody else wants it. And I understand it's basically desert and what they used to call wasteland on a lot of the older maps. Well, it really is not because there's Gamble's Quail in a lot of those spots. And that's what we're talking about today essentially within a striking distance of Las Vegas. So if you get tired of the Penn and Teller show or you're not one for gambling, well, there are birds. Another gamble spelling there. Gamble's quail, the dominant species near Las Vegas. The number one rule, find water, find birds. There's lots of guzzlers. There's water holes of various sorts out there. Look for those first. There are birds east of Alamo, which is about 100 miles north of Las Vegas. The arroyos and the slopes near the town of Searchlight are also a good place to start. That's just 50 miles south of town. Remember passing through there before there was an In-N-Out burger on that highway. Now there's two reasons to head for Searchlight, Nevada. Find the water, find the birds, find Las Vegas. And when you're sick and tired of finding all of those 
coins going in and none coming out of your slot machine, look for some gambles quail. This part of the show is brought to you by Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School. If you're looking for a new gun, how do you do it? You go to the gun shows, uh, search the internet, go to the local gun shop. Maybe you go to some of those online auctions. Well, if you can't find it there, I encourage you to take a look at Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School. Midvalleyclays.com is where you can take a look at their entire inventory of in-stock shotguns. And if you don't find anything there, well, they have relationships with most of the major manufacturers, personal relationships that could get that gun you want that you can't find anywhere else. Check out Mid valleyclays.com look at the existing inventory and then call Dave Fiedler Dave can help you find the gun you need even if it's hard to find and uh, I mentioned winter South Dakota but one of my favorite places is Huron South Dakota I'll be going there with my own group if you want to go to join us for the Fur Feathers Friends event or just come on your own to hunt the 124,000 acres of public access all season. HuntHuronSD.com is where you get your free information packet, maps, discounts, information. It's all there. They'll send you a whole envelope full of stuff and maybe a little tchotchke or two once in a while. Join them for the Ringneck Festival and Bird Dog Challenge in November or any time of the season for all that public access. Well, you know, my quest to learn more about upland game birds continues. It will never end, you know that. But in the next few years, I've devoted my study in large part to the quails. And you've learned some of that already, and we're going to learn a whole lot more about it now. Joining me on the Upland Nation podcast, Rocky Gutierrez. He's retired now, but he was a professor and Gordon Gullion Endowed Chair at the University of Minnesota. This guy knows game birds inside and out. I'm particularly interested in talking with Rocky about some of the work you did with and for A. Starker Leopold. If anybody recognizes that last name, we'll get deeper into that in a minute. But Rocky Gutierrez, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you very much for having me on this the show, Scott, and I really appreciate it. Well, love so, talking about quail. So do we, and uh, in general, and I, I mean that in the plural sense, not in the royal, royal sense. We are, uh, you know, I am personally very interested in this. My favorite bird, game bird these days, and uh, for a lot of reasons. But you have done so much work in in the overall world of of upland birds. Period. And I didn't say game birds because I mean upland birds in general. Um, why don't you start in, in, by giving us just a kind of a, a short backstory on you and your interest in all of that, and then we'll get down and dirty. Yeah, I, I, I uh, received my uh, initial interest in um, in hunting uh, upland game birds and also studying them from the time I uh, spent with my my father. Um, my earliest recollection was him coming back from pheasant hunting in the Rio Grande Valley of New Mexico. And uh, he was such a tremendous wing shot that he would, he would shoot pheasants out of the air with a 22, which is highly Ooh. illegal now, <laughs> highly illegal now, but that's, that's all he had. He didn't have a shotgun. So he would shoot these uh, pheasants out of the air with a 22. And I didn't think anything of it until I, he taught me how to shoot, and he could keep a can in the air for all all of the rounds of this pump twenty two. He had, so he was almost a trick shooter. And from that, I um, I got uh, sort of interested in hunting. And later on, he he uh, developed heart disease, so he couldn't really go in the field. And he uh, arranged for me to go bird hunting with with um, friends of his. And so I got, at a very early age, I, be, I began to hunt pheasants and quail and doves and, and other upland game birds in, in New Mexico. Of course, without a dog, because in those days, uh, not very many people had bird dogs. Yeah, yeah. So that, that was about the beginning of it. And then when I went in the Army, uh, I, I spent um, 
I was in Army Intelligence for four years, and uh, which is a uh, contradiction in terms, I guess. But, uh, I you spent, you uh, said it, not me. <laughs> yeah, I spent a couple of years in in uh, in Japan uh, during doing um, uh, work there, and I met a Japanese guy who uh, was the owner of a local gun shop, and I just uh, would go in there and look at his guns and. Eventually, we we actually became quite close friends and kept up a, um, a friendship for over fifty years until he he died recently, and I've been back to visit him. But in, in anyway, long story short, he would invite me uh, to go hunting with him, and through the um, through uh, the the army, I was able to purchase a Morocco shotgun, a twelve gauge shotgun, beautiful over and under. It went by the trade name of Charles Daly uh, sure. back in the day. Yeah, yeah. And, and I had this uh, superposed uh, trap gun, which was definitely not an Upland Game Bird gun. It was a it was a competition trap gun. I didn't know any better. I was uh-huh. just, you know I was a young young uh, young guy and I just was able to, to buy it uh, because of the exchange rate and so forth. And um, I took this I'll tell you this little story because it's kind of interesting and it, and it sort of solidified my interest in upland game bird hunting. Well, we used to go out hunting, and I was afraid to shoot. Because I, to be honest, I, I hadn't shot that much, and I wasn't a very good shot. <laughs> and and so we would be walking along, and he had he had a German short-haired pointer who he named John yeah, uh, for John Wayne. And um, uh, John would, would uh, go on point, and he encouraged me, my friend Toshio, would encourage me to go up and and uh, push the bird up and shoot it. And then I wouldn't do it because I was just, I was just petrified of shooting <laughs> because I knew I wasn't any good. And, and after two or three trips, I think they were starting to believe that maybe I was a little touched in the head because I'd never shoot my gun. And one day he, uh, uh, John went on point uh, in this bamboo patch and up gets this Chinese bamboo partridge. It's a perdix related oh, to the yeah. gray partridge. And and I swung on it, and then I, I just couldn't shoot. And so I, I just sat there, and I was sort of kicking myself and, you know, down on myself. And they went off chasing it. And then I hear the bird flush, and it comes through this mass of bamboo. And I was so disgusted, I just swung up. Boom, I shot. And the thing lands on the ground. So the dog runs up, gets it, and then he takes the bird from me. And I said, fine, if you want the bird, you can have it. But what I didn't know later on, he, he mounted this for me and gave it to me as a going away present wow. when I left Japan. So the next thing I knew, I was walking in the little town of Asakamachi where, I, where our, our secret base that everybody knew about uh, <laughs> was located. And um, I'd see somebody and, and, and they'd look at me and say, Ohayo gamasta, Rocky-san. They say, good morning, Rocky. And I'm going like, what? <laughs> And I'm, I, I could, and everybody was doing this to me. Well, it turns out I finally went into a local pub and uh, bought a beer and a stock. And then some of the local Japanese guys were started trying to talk to me. And I, I, I knew a little bit of Japanese at that time. And the long story short was that the, my Japanese friend and his hunting buddies thought I was such a magnificent shot that I didn't want to embarrass them by shooting. Oh because when God. they saw me shoot this bird in this dense mass of bamboo, they thought nobody could make that shot. <laughs> I love it. Oh. Yeah, and it was it was totally totally serendipitous. And then I started thinking, wow, this could be a lot of fun to do this, you know. Yeah. So that's how I really got interested in in upland game birds and in continuing that on through my my uh, graduate work uh, at New Mexico, where I worked on bantail pigeons for my master's degree and then I as you mentioned I went to work at uh with A Starker Leopold at Berkeley on mountain quail. Love it. Uh, I I love that story for a bunch of reasons. Number one, it'll never happen to me the shooting like that. Number two, I don't think I've ever heard a bird hunting story out of Japan before. So thank you for that. That is fantastic. Now you called it uh, uh, uh you know a relation to the partridge family. I've never heard of that bird. Now, the one most of us have heard of in Japan is probably not even from Japan, and that's the one we call uh, the Koternik's quail uh, uh, or, or the no, Japanese quail. 
Yeah, they are. They are native to okay. Japan. All yeah. right. So good. Um, that's and good. we had, we hunted them there, there as well. Uh, our our four main birds were the uh, Chinese bamboo partridge, which was which is introduced. Uh, the uh, Caternix quail that you mentioned. Uh, the uh, Japanese green pheasant, mm-hmm. which is now considered a subspecies of of the ring neck pheasant, yeah, and then um, and then the some uh, bird called the copper pheasant, which unfortunately I never was able to to kill. I saw I saw a couple of them, and they're just absolutely magnificent birds that have a tail uh, tail feathers about three feet long, and uh, just a gorgeous copper colored bird oh i bet i bet yeah. i i think we uh, uh someday i'll bore you with that story i think we had one land in our front yard about 15 years ago and the cats of course went batty um yeah and so did we because what the heck was it doing there but we have a guy who raises exotic game birds just down the road and i'm sure yeah, uh-huh. i'm sure it was a prison break uh, right. uh, Rocky Gutierrez is my guest on the Upland Nation podcast. Rocky knows he's forgotten more about game birds than we'll ever know, and that's why he's with us today. Um, I'm I'm so excited about many of the things that I want to ask you, but let's start with the really important stuff, Rocky. Over and under or a side-by-side? Uh, over and under for me. I, I just shoot better with them. Yeah. Uh, I, I, but, I, but I'll tell you from a sort of a aesthetic and philo- philosophical point of view, I, I love side-by-sides. And I have, I have uh, uh, several of them that, that, I, that I've used on occasion, but I just don't shoot as well with them as I do with a superposed. It's okay, because I'm the opposite, and I just blame it on the guys who taught me how to shoot. All right, You're right. <laughs> um, uh, narrow it down. Mountain Gambles or California Quail, your favorite? Uh, my favorite is actually Mountain Quail. But okay. My second favorite is, is cow quail, but I, you know, I love all of the quail. It's it's really hard. They all have their different attributes. Yeah. And and different and because I I've hunted every North American game game bird up on game bird that there is. I love it. Uh, and, and a lot in in Europe as well because I did um, quite a bit of genetics work on on Galliforms and so I made a trip across Europe um, hunting all of their uh, droughts. So I, I've I've have and then i've spent a lot of time in africa too hunting nice. upland game birds there we, we you know we can't do it all today but we will talk again very soon um so let, let, let's narrow it down a little bit and in my introduction to um a starker leopold who is the son of aldo leopold and you can give us more background on all of that but of course he wrote sand county almanac among other things but a starker wrote a book that's long out of print that you probably had to memorize as part of your um, uh, thesis exam or your doctoral dissertation on California quail. And I grew up to a large degree in that area. And in the, the numbers of birds in the photos that were in that book just flummoxed me. How did you get involved in all of that and studying with A. Starker? So, um, Starker, um, when I when I got to to Berkeley, was as as you mentioned, was working on that book and and uh, was uh, an acknowledged expert on California quail. And as as a matter of fact, I actually didn't memorize it. I I read the <laughs> I read the page spruce for him though <laughs> <laughs> on that book when he was when he's working on it. And I contributed some of the photographs to to that, um, but. One of the things that uh, Starker uh, asked me is, what, he had, he had uh, students working on California quail, and he asked me if I wanted to work on uh, California quail or uh, another species, and, I, and I, I suggested to him that I was interested in mountain quail, mainly because uh, there, uh, nobody knew anything about mountain quail relative to what we knew about California quail, or valley quail, yeah, yeah, and and um, and so that was intriguing, and also too they were quite quite a bit more challenging to hunt. So Starker had this great idea. He he um, he gave me uh, money for a non-resident bird license and and some gas, and said, "Why don't you go hunting mountain quail 
And he said, if you, if you like hunting mountain quail, he says, you'll, you'll like working with them. And I said, ah, capital idea. <laughs> so I went out and hunted mountain quail, and, and they just, they, they punished me. And, and after that punishment of by, uh, fighting the brush and walking up steep mountains, I said, this is the bird I want to hunt. I love because it. they were really a challenge to me. And so that's how I got in, in, involved in, in working with mountain quail. But uh, when, I, when I made a proposal to my graduate committee and also uh, an open seminar at, at the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, um, and, and this, this might sound brutal to a lot of people, but, you know, we're from a day where uh, when we didn't get too upset when people criticized us for legitimate reasons. <laughs> but I, but I, I, uh, I gave my seminar, and I was about five minutes into my seminar, and one of the professors said, Rocky, he said, are you so committed to this mountain quail project that you just can't drop it right now and save us all 45 minutes of time? <laughs> and, and I went, oh, my God, was it that bad? And then, and then I started to think about it in, in, a, in a critical sense and said, you know, he's right. That what I wanted to do was a natural history of mountain quail. And, of course, it hadn't been done. Yeah. But, but it just wasn't that interesting from a, from a, from a scientific point of view. Uh, it, it, it's important from a natural history point of view and a, important from wildlife management, but not really from the high level that people that you were expected to, to perform at Berkeley. Mm-hmm. And so I, I kind of went back in the field uh, a little bit depressed, and, and I went, I went. of course, my, my solution to depression, right, is to go hunting. Okay. So, so uh, and, I took, and you have, by the way, you have a doctorate, so can you prescribe that for all of us? Right, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, I, uh, so I took my bird. I had a, a wonderful bird dog, the best I've ever had, named Toshio. I named him after my oh, I, Japanese I like buddy. Yeah, and, and it was also a German short hair pointer, and and I went out with him and went up to my my study area, and I was walking along, and the dog went on point, and so automatically I walked up, and and the birds flushed, and I I I got the first one, and then I swung, and I got a second one, luckily, and and it turned out that one of them was a mountain quail, and the other one was a California quail, oh. and this this light went on in my head, and said, wow, how did that happen? And then, I, and then I started reading up on the relationship between mountain and California quail and, and realized that sometimes they would hybridize infrequently, quite infrequently, but there were various uh, accounts of, seeing, of people seeing them in mixed flocks. And so I, I asked the question, well, what is the ecological difference between mountain and California quail? And when they're in areas of sympatry, which means where they occur together, mm-hmm. uh, how do they how do they get along without without um, severe competition? And so that became the basis of my doctoral dissertation. So I melded the two uh, and studied the comparative ecology of mountain and California quail. And so a simple thing like a hunting trip led to a, a really wonderful um, a study. At least I, I I don't mean to say that in a in a um, uh, in a bragging sense, but wonderful to me in the sense that I was able to uh, comp- to study both of these species simultaneously because I just so happened to have a study area where where the two species coexisted. Oh, it, they were yeah, they were found together. All, uh, and sometimes I'd find one, sometimes I'd find the other in places I would go. So I, I worked all of that out and determined how they separated themselves ecologically and avoided competition. I, by the way, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, and that's Rocky Gutierrez. Rocky is, uh, well, he's now retired, so he gets to go go hunting more. But he he taught at the University of Minnesota. He's got a uh, doctorate from Berkeley, et cetera, et cetera. But the guy knows his stuff, as you can hear already. But I am so glad you brought up uh, the term. What is the term? Sympatry. Yeah, sympatry. Yeah. Yeah, because I will tell the biologist. Here it, and I've written articles on this. I, when I have to write an article about mountain quail, I usually write about killing most of them in valley quail habitat. And I tell the biologists out here, and they think I'm hallucinating. Uh, 
Now I'm just going to bring up your name and send them to one of your peer-reviewed papers on that subject and make sure that they understand that I'm, I'm not on anything besides uh, my own natural adrenaline when I shoot mountain quail flying out of the same covey as valley quail. Now, what, yeah. what causes that? Why do they do that? Well, uh, in, in um, well, there, there, there's a, there's a couple of different reasons. One is when if you hunt them in the winter time, mountain quail will move down out of out of the higher yeah country. So if if you're if you're hunting, say in the Cascades or the Sierra Nevada, some place where they where they the mountain quail will normally uh, move up into the higher country to breed and then they move down to lower country um, in response to the snowfall. Yeah. Then then you then they mix uh, with California quail that are naturally at lower elevation. Mm-hmm. So that's where that's one cir- circumstance that you'll see them. Another circumstance is, is when you get habitats that are suitable to both species in close proximity. And an example where I where I was in the central coastal California is you have a, a forest called a, a mixed mesophytic forest or broad square full forest, but basically it's it's a forest that's that's dominated by madrone, uh, uh, live oak, uh, black oak, and and other white oak, other species of oaks, um, and it's mostly evergreen, but there are some deciduous species. Okay. In there, and and mount and they'll have some understory in there. Mountain quail love that stuff. Yeah, they love that habitat. And then adjacent to that, you have um, uh, more open chaparral or open meadow situations, the edge habitats that the California quail likes. And because the, these things are in close proximity, sometimes the groups just come together. Yeah. And 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 they and they form short term associations. Yeah, they, they, they get along uh, well enough to where they're they're not fighting all the time, are they? Right. You know, uh, funny that my one observation on this, and then we'll we'll get, climb out of this rabbit hole back to stuff that might be of interest to everybody else as well. But uh, <clears throat> quite often, when I find them together, they're near or almost in water. Hmm. You know, so are, are you are you hunting them in late fall or? Um, um, winter, or, uh, early or... fall, early fall, uh, when it's still warm where I'm hunting. Okay. So okay. it just, it may be just coincidence, but anyway, <clears throat> lots, lots to talk about on that down the road as well. Yeah. Um, well, both of them, are, both of them are dependent on water. So, yeah. so that's uh, one case in which I would actually find them. And actually in my, in the monograph I wrote on, uh, mountain and California quail, I, I pointed out that this is one of the situations you, where you find them is in yeah. riparian areas yeah. where it they found together. Makes sense, um, Rocky. Let's go. Let's focus on California quail. And just for the record, a California quail is a valley quail, and it lives in a whole bunch of places besides California, as we both know, and as most people know. But for those who don't, now we do. Um, answer the one question that I've always wondered about. I'll get a you know I'll get a great a great point from a dog birds will get up they'll scatter to all points of the compass and even when i mark them carefully because i missed them all and i'm going to come back and try and hunt out the singles they're not where i mark them they hit the ground and run don't they well uh a lot of them do but not all of them yeah i mean some sometimes they're they're they, they remain uh uh where, where do you where do you find them but but oftentimes they they uh, they have a propensity to run more than say bob whites for yeah, sure. Yeah. Or uh, another example is uh, uh, Mern's quail, uh-huh. uh, the Montezuma quail in in Arizona. Th- those things usually stick really tight. But as of late, because, oh, uh, owing to heavy hunting pressure, they've learned to run too, and uh, and they're not very good runners at all. Yeah. I mean, they're they're they are built for digging. And not running. Yeah. So, uh, so that that's that's one of the situations where you're seeing is that is that the birds hit the ground and they just take off running. If if we're gonna if we're gonna chase them, uh, again back to my scenario, covey flush, mark down some singles. We're gonna go over there. They're not exactly where we thought they were. 
Mm-hmm. Where are they going to run to? What What is their favorite hiding place? Well, anything that's that's got uh, protective cover that's um, dense. Yeah. So if they can if they can get underneath a, a shrub or or even brush yeah. that's fall on the ground, anything that where they where they feel secure and uh, that they they don't feel can be penetrated by say a hawk mm-hmm. that's that's where you'll find them yeah because uh, i've even i've seen him seen seen him under you know uh, limbs of of oak uh, trees that have broken in oh, storms yeah. yeah and the like yeah no in fact uh, our friends at pheasants forever have a term for that i think they call it hinging you will take a shelter belt or a bunch of a stand of trees and you will cut some of those lower limbs almost all the way through so they the the far end the outside end hits the ground and creates right. that little kind of habit that shelter if you will yeah um, i mean the the trick in hinging is to keep of the bottom side of the cambium which is the which is uh, the living yeah, tissue yeah, yeah. Uh, intact and when when you do that the nourishment will still get to that that um Part that you that you force to the ground, yeah. and then that that becomes living, and the and the wound heals over, so that you actually create a living natural brush pile. Wow, I love that, and I I would never have guessed that. Thanks. Um, hey, we've got a, we're just getting warmed up around here. That's Rocky Gutierrez. I'm Scott Linden. This is the Upland Nation podcast. A couple quick breaks, uh, Rocky. You can uh, relax for a moment. I'll be back to you in a second. The rest of you. Don't go away. We've got a lot more to talk about. Not only Rocky, but we're going to talk about what you're talking about. Uh, I asked a question recently, what do you offer your dog besides water on a hunt? You'll be amazed at some of the answers there and what you all say as a group. First off, sageandbreaker.com is where you learn more about taking care of your shotguns. They've got some incredibly well-produced videos on cleaning semi-autos and break-open guns. If you want to learn more about how to do it right, go to sageandbreaker.com. While you're there, sign up for the mailing list. You'll always get free shipping. You won't miss the sales. It's all at sageandbreaker.com. And RoughlandKennels.com can't say enough about their products. You know, more dogs ride in a Roughland kennel than any other performance kennel. One of the many reasons. You take your new Roughland kennel out of the box, put it in your truck, and put your dog in it. No assembly required. No nuts, no bolts to lose, to fail. No assembly at all. And because of that, the interior of that box is a little bit bigger. You know the lip around the outside of your dog crate? Don't need it when it's a one-piece crate. Learn more about what they have to offer in the way of dog crates and accessories. I'm looking at Flix Fan right now, and it's doing the job on a hot summer day. RoughlandKennels.com Welcome back to the Upland Nation podcast, Rocky Gutierrez. So, uh, hey, put us somewhere on the map. Where are you right now, and what are your travel plans for hunting season? Well, I um, I live in Northwest California in a little town called Fieldbrook, which is probably about twenty twenty five miles north and slightly northeast of uh, Eureka. Mm. Uh, and um, I, I live in a redwood forest. Actually, I have um, California quail uh, right out my window. I don't see any right now, but uh, I have a covey that hangs around the house uh, because I feed them. I mostly have bantail pigeons and morning doves. Oh wow! But but um, we have uh, you know it, it's a it's a beautiful little place. Lots of lots of bears this year. Five different bears on my trail cameras that have been hanging around the house. Wow. So my plans for this um, for the this year of hunting are not solidified yet. I'll probably hunt a mountain in California quail in in uh, in November uh, on a friend of mine's place in Mendocino County, um, and 
at, at the same time that I, I hunt deer down there as well. Sure, yeah. Deer and pigs and whatever. Yeah, I love that and uh, hope to be down actually a little bit farther south from there myself uh, this season for at least a day or two. Um, when you're hunting, what are the things that really, I mean, you're a professional in many ways at all this stuff. You're a scientist, you, you know all these things, but something like that first experience with uh, the double on mountain and valley, that's got to be one of the driving forces for you these days. Tell me all about it. Well, you know, I, I, I think I think I'm like everybody else in that, um, that we we search for these special experiences, whether or not they are um, with our friends or our dogs or just being out uh, out of the out of doors. I've I've done a lot of research actually on on what motivates people to do things. And um, and that's what it all boils down to from from large studies is that there are motivating factors beyond um, well beyond killing and, oh, yeah. and and meat that that make all of us want to want to do something because trust me when you hunt mountain quail and and you get beat up by by the habitat um, you, you've got to love what you're doing or you won't do it again um, and and I think that's for me, when when I still had dogs, my last um, bird dog, she died last year. Um, when you know, when you have these bird dogs, I mean, I, I to me, it's, the, hunting birds is not the same if you don't have a bird dog. I mean, you can do it, and I did it for many years when I didn't when I didn't have a bird dog. But there's just a a, a different sort of uh, relationship and and meaning to the whole activity. When you're walking along with 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 um, a bird dog that you've trained, um, and um, you you become in tune with 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 another uh, animal that uh, that uh, you've put so much effort into, and it it just makes the the all of these experiences heighten. And so I think that that's um, I think that's what all of us uh, look for when when we hunt upland game birds um in 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 the natural environment uh man i can't i can't agree more i've never heard the term in tune used that way but it is absolutely spot on so yeah we're we're all together on that one absolutely um if you were going to um, pick a species of all the upland game bird species on any continent that you find the most interesting slash challenging what would it be? Well, boy, that that's a hard one because I, you know, as I said, mentioned, I I've, I've yeah. hunted a, a lot of species and 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 probably I'll give you a, I'll give you a couple. Uh, let, let's let's ignore um, the, the quail in North America because All right. I, you know those, those are my those are my first love. Um, but I'll, I'll pick two. One one is a capercaillie. Oh yeah. Uh, and and the other one is the guinea fowl, and and the capercaillie is because it's just a magnificent beast, and you hunt them in a way, at least the way I hunted them in in Finland. Uh, I did a big research project on genetics of of grouse of the world, and so I had to go around the world shooting grouse. Oh, I mean, it, there was no other way around it. It was oh, just okay. sort of one of these things that. You have to do in the interest of science. So I, I went around the world shooting grouse. My wife is sitting there rolling her eyes. Yeah, you had to do it, all right. Oh, boy. So, so uh, w- w- they have these Finnish spitzes. Yeah, which is a, yeah. Which is a, which is a, a dog that looks kind of like a, not like a husky in terms of coloration, but in, in terms of its, its shape and form. Yeah. And they would just take off like a bat out into the woods, into the forest, and then you'd hear them barking like crazy, and what they would do is they'd chase a capricaly up a tree mm-hmm. and run around this tree barking its head off, and then you'd sneak up and taste this capricaly. That's and, right. And, and whereas I, I'm, I'm not, I, I prefer to shoot capricaly on the wing, and I have done that uh, a number of times. But I just found that sort of fascinating, the way that the way these Finnish spitzes uh, worked on a bird and put it up there and distracted it. Well, you came up uh, and 
and, and you know, you're making a lot of noise, right? Coming up to to this capricale, or you're trying to sneak up there, but you still make noise. But that that dog was able to pin the attention of of that capricale on itself, such that you could get a you could sneak up and get a you know a clean shot at capricale because they're, just, they're almost as well they're as big as a hen turkey. So you know it's best to shoot them in the head and uh, like a uh, like a, uh, a turkey. And then the other one, the other species is. Uh, uh, a guinea fowl, and and people are going to laugh about this because you know you think of guinea fowl like these barnyard chickens, you know that you see. Yeah, they're they're people. they're right next to the peacocks in our right, country. Right you next know. to the peacocks. And, yeah, and uh, so the first time I went to Africa for the purpose of of hunting, uh, I went there um, and to collect uh, guinea fowl and francolins and quail and other upland game birds uh, that were that for a genetic study we were doing and um, and as we were um, working on after uh, we were looking for these Franklins I told uh, this colleague of mine from the from uh, uh, university in in uh, Pretoria I said well I said why don't we just go shoot some guinea fowl and get it over with <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, because I just, you know, I had no respect for them. Yes, yeah, yeah. And and he stops and he looks at me, and he says, "Rocky," he says, "We have we we have a saying in South Africa." He says, "The first time you hunt guinea fowl, it's for fun. The second time, it's for revenge." <laughs> that's a bumper sticker said, here <laughs> yeah snicker snicker and and all the, you know we went after these guinea fowl and we could not get them and so we we had trackers surrounding them and we'd hide and do all i mean it, it was like a military maneuver to get these guinea fowl in range and and uh finally we we got these we, we got some um push towards us and we were hiding in this in this uh uh, uh, ravine, and the guinea fowl are coming, flying perfectly towards us, and I'm going, I'm licking my chops, saying, "This is, this is it." You know, they're they're gonna they're gonna bite the dust here. And my wife says, "There they are," and she points her finger at them, and boom, they just veered off like oh. dust. And, you know, and 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 we all looked at it, and she says, "Oops, I think I made a mistake." And I, we all had a good laugh over it because. You know, we'd worked so hard to get these birds in position, and then I realized just how wily these things are. Yeah. Uh, you know, they don't they don't want to be pushed. They don't want to be. They don't want a dog to point them. They are really, really spooky. And so, you know, then I, I gained a great deal of respect for for guinea fowl after that. And then I thought that was one of the most uh, interesting experiences that in in the Capricale because. When I did this study on Capricorn, we we walked an average of 17 kilometers per shot. Oh my God! For, <laughs> for, for the Capricorn, and it, uh, my one experience with that uh, would have been a Russian Capricorn back in the day, and I turned that trip down. I'm glad I did because the helicopter crashed. Luckily, oh, wow. everybody yeah. lived to tell about it. But that was back in the Wild West days over there. Um, let, let's go to Europe because now I'm intrigued with all of this. Um, you know, if if any of us know European hunting, and I'm using it in the broadest sense of the term, we know driven hunts in Great Britain, or we know uh, you know red grouse on the moors in Scotland. But on the continent itself, what are some of the you know the the hunts that you've done over there? Well, I've, I've actually only hunted in Finland, uh -huh. and and that was basically I had a a, a permit from the Finnish government sure. to uh, to to collect fifteen of every upland game bird species they had in Finland, which is um, hazel grouse, capercaillie, willow grouse, and rock ptarmigan and black grouse. Uh, so I was I was. I was able to, to, to go there and, and, and hunt them. And um, so, the, so that's, that's the, the, uh, the limit of, of, my, um, of my experience. I mean, I've, I, I have a lot of Norwegian and Swedish uh, friends who 
tell me a lot about their hunting exploits in, in uh, upland ga- game birds. And, and, of course, the Spaniards have wonderful uh, shooting on um, uh, red, red lake partridge. Uh, and so uh, you, that's, uh, that's uh, a notable um, species to, to hunt there. But, but most of my hunting has been respect, res- restricted to um, Finland. And, yeah. and all of those species are either uh, coniferous-related or uh, deciduous forest-related birds, with the exception um, of the uh, rock ptarmigan, which occurs in Lapland, in Uh in, uh, treeless areas, or more or less treeless areas. Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, uh, swing it all the way back to our own time zone here in the West, where we hunt uh, valley quail, California quail, uh, as much as possible. And mine are in the yard right now, I can tell, um, like clockwork. Um, but what is their day like? You know, in the fall, when we're trying to find them with our dogs, uh, you know, they get up. They do this, then they do that, then they take a break, then they do this, and then it's time to go somewhere. What What yeah. is their typical day like? Well, it depends on the season of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, in the during fall, the win- yeah, there, during the fall, uh, it's it's somewhat temperature dependent. So if it's uh-huh. if it's cold, they'll, they'll feed a lot longer uh-huh. than they normally would. Uh, and if it's warm, then they'll they'll feed a while and. And then they'll go find a uh, a shady spot, um, either under some dense brush, or under a tree, or whatever, and just sort of loaf around uh, all day. And and actually, interestingly, uh, this is one of the things that I was successful doing um, with my study. And the reason why nobody had been able to uh, work on mountain quail before because they didn't, they really didn't know how to work with them, or how to be able to gain an advantage to watch them. Yeah. And I had a dog for who, for some reason, I mean, this, this dog was uncanny with almost all species of birds, but it, I could, I had that dog where it would corner mountain quail and get on the other side of them, pin them down. And then I could whistle to him and he'd come right over to me and he'd sit, sit down, lay down and I'd sit down and these mountain quail would 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 remain in their uh, cross position underneath or in cover for you know twenty thirty minutes, and then they would get up and walk around. Uh, and and then I just watch them, and and they they would go about their business. So I had a I had I recorded hundreds and hundreds of hours of just simply watching them from from daybreak to to, to dark. And so that's why I say during that when it's cooler, they tend to feed longer, um, and when it's warm, they tend to feed. Uh, if they if it's hot, they'll, they'll they'll drink water, and then they'll go back to cover and loaf around for a good part of the day. And occasionally going out and pecking a little bit, and then and then going back to cover, and then they'll go out and feed in the evening time. You know, whereas in the winter in the winter time they. They'll feed much, much longer than that. Oh, yeah. And and do you think that's all temperature-related? I mean, they're trying to bulk up on calories? Uh, yeah, I think so. And yeah. also, it, it's a combination of that. And and during the winter, they they switch, at least in, in the, the coastal areas where you have uh, winter green up, yeah. they switch from seeds uh, to uh, soft foods oh. like uh, uh, fillery and clovers and and the leafy materials. Yeah. Uh, and they don't eat grass. Yeah. So uh, there are very little, very little grass. So they, they eat these, what we call forbs, uh, which are, which are clover and, uh, and fillery uh, and um, species like that, vetch. And they'll eat the green material. And so when they're eating green material, they, they, they seem to eat a lot more and they get less nutrition from it. Because oh, it, yeah, it's yeah. Because it's got more water in it. And nowhere near as much protein. Probably. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I got well, just Hillary has got a lot of yeah. Fillery has got a lot of protein. Okay. In it. yeah, I, it's like 16%. I, I think Fillery and Vetch ought to be characters in a Dickens novel, by the way. Yeah, uh, right. I love those yeah. names. Um, yeah, they, I, are, they are great. Now, you mentioned mountain quail do do that. Are the valley quail doing pretty much the same thing? Uh, pretty much the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so here's something I, I uh, in my own research last night, observed. Um, three adults and 18 chicks. Was that two broods with a missing adult, or was that one brood with an extra adult? Uh, it, it could be either one. Uh-huh, okay. Um, you know, th- this is one of the things that actually Stark and I had... A- uh, a bit of an argument about in his book, uh, because because in his book it, it was it was well recognized for for many years that that in in bumper years of of quail production, like when you get these really good rains in in Central California and Southern California, um, you have sometimes you know tremendous number of quail that are produced, and and what he would see was that you would have four or five males and no females and a whole bunch of chicks, mm. you know, like 30, 40 chicks. Oh my. And, and he was, and he, he, he suggested that these were, uh, benevolent uncles. Yes. So that, so that the pair would, would raise a brood and would give it off to, uh, a, a, you know, an unrelated, um, uh, male bird that didn't have a mate, and you know, from from the evolutionary standpoint, that that would be considered what we call maladaptive. You know, why wh- animals don't invest energy and time in in animals that are are young that are not their own. Yeah, uh, yeah. And and so the alternative explanation is that. This was some sort of sequential, what we call sequential polyandry, uh, or that females would mate with a male, would have a brood with that male, and then desert that male and go go mate with another male. Yeah, yeah. And then raise a second brood, uh, and um, and that's probably the more likely uh, scenario. Yeah. Uh, that that these that these adult males that are with these chicks. They're they're guarding their own um, their own young, and then the the reason why they all coalesce or group together in uh, one big mass is because it it may be uh, advantageous for uh, predator avoidance. Sure. So the more eyes you have, the more likely you are to see a detect a predator predator when it's coming towards you. And also, uh, in our case at least, and maybe yours too, the food is concentrated. Yeah. Yeah, well, that makes sense because some of those chicks were smaller than others. So, for, so we had two bunches, a smaller bunch and a bigger bunch. They're all together now. But that—that that is what these are the questions we ask each other as we're looking out the window. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So you answered the question about using a dog for research, and we know a lot of the Woodcock guys will do that over the years. We've seen mm-hmm. that in various ways, and, and I'm, I'm intrigued by that as well. But let's go to the hunting side one more time. Um, if if you were to come up here, or I were to go down there, and and we were going to go quail hunting, and and I was going to bring my dog because there was no better dog around, uh, how, where would you start a hunt? Would, would we drive a long way, and where would we drive to? Not not the latitude and longitude, but what kind of habitat would be the best for us to hunt? Yeah, well, I I suppose that really depends on what your preference in 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 hunting is. Yeah. So, in other words, my preference is to shoot birds that are pointed and yeah. and and on the wing. We there, take a vote. Are, that, by the way, that's what we all want. Yeah, but there there are people that I've I've done podcasts with who their their attitude is if it runs like a rabbit, dies like a rabbit. Yeah. You know, yeah. They shoot them, and, and you know. Personally, I really I don't care if they want to do that or not. That's just not my thing. Yeah. Um, as a consequence, I I look for places, and this is answer answers your question. I look for places that I can actually walk through. Uh-huh. You uh huh. You mean liter- because, literally? Yeah, literally yeah. walk through. Because, yeah. because a lot of a lot of really good mountain quail habitat, and even California quail habitat in my area, is impenetrable. Yeah. I mean, you see them on the edges, and and that's what. I'd say 95% of the people who hunt quail in Humboldt County shoot them on the roads. Yeah. Uh, because that's where the, that's where you see them. 
uh, because your alternative is to is to um, buck brush. Yeah. And and so what I would suggest is that find a, an area that's been burned by a, a fire, and and go there a couple of years after the the fire. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because it'll be it'll be open, and it'll have lots of the the shrub will start coming back. And there'll be lots of food for quail, and the, the, and, I, and assuming the quail have a good hatch year, uh, you would you would find uh, uh, a fair amount of quail in these more op- more open uh, brush habitats that were created by fires. Yeah, yeah. So you know, as devastating as these fires are, and as as scary as they are, that is one beneficial effect that they have. Is is that that they create habitat for wildlife? Uh, yeah, and it's hard to have that discussion in a rational way when, when the fire fires bearing down on your property. But I understand that completely, absolutely. Um, by the way, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. That's Rocky Gutierrez. The guy knows his stuff. We're just scratching the surface. We will do this again, I promise you, but, uh, if Rocky will have me again. But that we'll talk about that later. Um, do you ever use, maybe in your research or maybe now, do you ever use a call or do you ever whistle like a bird uh, as a hunting strategy? Uh, I... have I haven't recently. I used to. Yeah. Um, and um, I used to have a quail call, and I'd, I'd give um, the assembly call of um, of cow quail to locate them. I've done it with chuckers, and and um, in in uh, when I hunted in Finland, we had a little um, little whistles that we would we would imitate the uh, assembly call of the uh, uh, hazel grouse. And so I yes, I have used them. Uh, I I haven't used them. Uh, recently, but but I I've definitely done it, and then, and it's effective in terms of uh, pinpointing birds that that are scattered, for example. Yeah, yeah, and I, I've used it for that, and then just for fun, uh, aggravating them. Uh, it used to be I was batting about twenty twenty percent on that. They would come running sometimes when you do that assembly call. Yeah, right, because they want to get back together. That's the whole yeah. purpose of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but, but speaking of getting back together in assembly calls, um, v- valley quail in particular, uh, but maybe mountain quail too, enlighten us on all of that. They uh, they roost a little differently than the more familiar bobwhites do. Right. They they roost up off the ground as opposed to on the ground. Yeah. So uh, scale quail, um, mer- uh, merns quail, and bobwhites all roost in the ground mm-hmm. and and the um, mountain quail california quail and if if gamble quail have access to to shrubs they will mo- roost above the ground yeah yeah <clears throat> there's nothing more exciting than running your dog first thing in the morning and having him get under that really big juniper about the time you walk past and the whole covey flies out huh Whew. Yeah, well, you know that that that's that's actually an interesting observation because um, the likelihood uh, this this is a guess on my part, but when when you see a a covey of a, of of a group of birds uh, in a in a, a a tree like that, it's probably because they've seen you and have jumped up there. Uh, I've I have seen that happen on occasion. Because when I sat there, well, like I mentioned earlier before, when I used to sit there and watch these birds, I, I'd see where they'd go to, uh, where they'd go to roost, and then they come back in the dark and sit down there and wait, watch them come out. And, and as soon as they can see the ground, oh. they're on the ground. Oh, that is. And so you may be seeing them. You you may be witnessing something you didn't observe. Yes. Which is the birds jumping up there when they saw the dog i've seen that enough to agree with anybody who's got more academic credentials than me which is everybody listening plus you rocky yeah that makes all the sense in the world i am going to make a note of that thank you very much um will they um go to roost late do they go to roost as the sun sets and i ask this not rhetorically but based on my own hard-won experience when do they go up there 
Well, uh, I, I've seen him go uh, to roost right about sunset, and I've also seen him go to roost when it's almost pitch black. Yeah. So there's variability in, as to when they will when they will go to roost. But I would I would say they're they're almost like turkeys in a sense that that they start moving towards their roost site. Yeah. Uh, when it when it's getting towards sunset, mm-hmm. and and when they actually jump up um, into the into the tree is 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 more variable. Yeah. Uh, the exact time, but but I've seen I've seen them go up early, and I've seen them go up when it's absolutely pitch almost pitch black. I I could barely see them. I only knew they were going up there because mm-hmm. I heard I heard them crashing around in them in the brush. You know, the other thing about valley quail that I've, I've really come to appreciate in the last three or four years is how broad their vocabulary really is. I don't know what they're saying, but they've got a lot of, a lot of versions of it. Yeah. You know, there, there there's a, I would alert your readers to this, that there's a, um, there's a series uh, called the birds of the world um, it used to be, it's an amalgam of a, of a, of a series of publications called Birds of North America and uh, Birds of the World. And, and now it's all Birds of the World. And they, um, it's, it's published under the auspices of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Mm-hmm. And, and they have, they have um, species accounts of every single bird in the world uh, on this, including... Um, vocalizations and and descriptions of the vocalizations and what the, what they mean and 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 the like and in both both phonetic descriptions and also recordings uh, of these uh quail and uh you have to have a, a subscription to to access it but the libraries uh, likely have it uh, in your area and if, if they don't you should ask them to get it mm-hmm. uh get a subscription to it and and they and these things are these accounts of of um, birds are updated as new information uh, is accumulated. So I wrote the one for mountain quail. Uh, some other people I know wrote the one for California quail, and um, and I, I think they're really good resources for for answering the qu- kind of question that you just uh, mused about, which is the variation in the type of calls they have and what they mean. Yeah, it's it's fascinating to me as I uh, as I learn more and more about them, and we're lucky enough to have, well, as of today, four home coveys, which is uh, remarkable for us. We've had a good year, and I'm knocking wood as I say that. Um, uh, let's get out of the truck, put on our vest, uh, get the dog set, turn on the electric collar, and uh, cut them loose. What? piece of gear is in your vest that we probably forgot to bring or never thought about bringing when you're hunting quail? Well, uh, EMP. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, uh, you, you know, my, my, one of my big focuses is, is really the, the health and the care of, of my dog. So yeah. I, you know, I, I'd rather forget my, my my shotgun shell, <laughs> and to forget something that that that's going to save the the life of my dog or make it comfortable or whatever. So I, I my my packing list is always with 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 a, a little first aid kit yeah. that I can I can stop the bleeding of a dog, um, maybe a, a, a some vet wrap to 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 put a patch over a wound or something like that. Uh, uh, anything that that I might help them, and always always have uh, wa- uh, you know extra water yep. um, with me, m- some food for them, things like that. So that's yeah. the first thing, and then uh, and other than that, I'll, I just want to make sure I got my shotgun away, my shells, and ev- virtually everything yep. else is is gravy. Yeah, you there know? you go. You know, it's funny. I was telling somebody not uh, three or four nights ago. You know, I I always uh, I've 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 actually used up two tubes of emt gel but yeah. i've never used it on any of my own dogs <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah. I, I guess i'm lucky and i'm knocking wood as i say that uh, you know um because you know this stuff like every but like nobody else if 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 we are making a uh if, if we are making a mistake when hunting valley quail uh is it 
that habitat question about not going to the right place, or is there something else we can do from a tactical standpoint that we're probably not doing? No, I, I think I think it's really habitat. Yeah. And then again, pay attention to the seasons of the year. Uh, yeah. And, and season, I mean, it's always the fall or winter. Yep. But but during during the the early fall when it's a, still a little bit warmer, they're often uh, more in their summer roost zone. So that's down on these riparian riparian zones yeah. along the streams and and uh, areas that have water. Yeah. Uh, because they'll they'll still be wanting to drink. And then as as the uh, as the rains come, if they come, and we always cross our fingers in <laughs> California for this stuff anymore. Uh, as as the rains come, then they disperse, and so then you have to think more broadly about where where these birds might be, and they will expand uh, their their ranges tremendously. They'll they'll go. Uh, I've seen them go miles from wh- where you normally would see them. Because really? now they're not restricted from they're not restricted to water sources, and they can just wander around because they're getting all their moisture from the from the green forbs mm-hmm. that we met, mentioned earlier. I uh, that that is very good to know, and there's a whole bunch more in that world that we want to explore in another podcast. But for now, I'm going to turn you loose. I promise to give you one hour, and you're doing perfectly on that. Rocky Gutierrez is a retired professor from the University of Minnesota. The guy knows his upland birds of all sorts. We focus on the important ones. Those are the game birds both here and around the world. Rocky, I sure enjoyed this. Maybe sometime soon we'll get together and um, and do some field research together. Thanks a bunch for being a part of the Upland Nation podcast. Well, thank you very much, Scott, for having me. It's probably the shortest hour I've spent this year. I'm flattered. Thank you very much. We'll spend more than an hour together in the field soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, wow, that was incredible, and I'm so grateful to Rocky Gutierrez for being a part of the Upland Nation podcast. The guy is not only a great academic because he's talking about stuff we love, but he's a hunter as well. So thank you again, Rocky. Hey, we're still rolling here at the podcast. We got our um, listener poll uh, from the e-newsletter. Besides water, do you offer your dog any snacks during a hunt i think you'd be interested in some of that it's coming right up first let's talk about pointer shotguns for a couple reasons number one new website pointer shotguns.com hey what a concept yeah so um they've devoted an entire website to their products and a whole bunch of material from me from videos to written stuff. So if you want to shop all of the varieties of pointer shotguns, including their new single shot pump gun, a work of art at a price that's a thing of beauty, something for everybody there from high end target guns down to the, you know, the entry level gun for a newcomer or somebody who's looking to upgrade from a pump to an over and under, for example, it's all at pointer shotguns.com. And then one more reminder, if you're interested in raising funds to help retired bird dogs find their forever homes, CAMO is the organization for you. Canine Adoption and Mentoring Outdoors, put together by my friends at Pheasant Bonanza over there in Tecama, Oklahoma. There's an event coming up. It's the Burt County Bird Bounty, November 3rd through 6th. It's everything from upland and waterfowl hunting to sporting clays, social events. It includes lodging and meals, of course. The deadline to sign up is October 1st. Learn more at camo, K-A-M-O-I-N-C dot org. Camoinc dot org. Always using the social media uh, pages of various sorts to learn more about what you're doing and uh, maybe help you learn more about what everybody else is doing. 
And towards that end, I asked a question in our e-newsletter. Have you gotten it yet, by the way? Sign up for it at uh, finebirdhuntingspots.com. Anyway, ask the question, besides water, do you offer your dog any snacks during a hunt? A lot of us are kind of obsessed about that kind of stuff because it is related to dog performance. And uh, now that I can't get that old dog energy bar anymore, I'm looking for suggestions. Well... 42% of you said you don't give your dog anything. 58% of you said, heck yeah, I do. H-R-C-H-U-H Wildfire Deacon, thank you for your recipe. You've made your own pemmican the last two years. Thank you and appreciate your sharing it with everybody on our Facebook page. Eric Copang says he doesn't give anything to a hunt during a hunt and he waits at least an hour after a hunt before feeding good advice vhd hank after listening to this podcast he started using glycocharge at the end of a hunt that's that uh, maltodextrin that you give a dog uh, in a water solution before you feed to recharge their muscle cells overnight works for him might work for you as well Uh, i think i've got something on the website findbirdhuntingspots.com about that so poke around over there and learn more about why i think it works And uh, one more reminder, we are brought to you in part by TrueLockChokes.com. If you're looking for a way to improve your shooting overnight or with the twist of a choke tube wrench, buy some really good machined and well-engineered choke tubes. Here's some incentives for you. Any orders of three or more chokes, you'll get a 10% discount. Any orders over $99.99, you'll get a free choke tube case. It's all at truelockchokes.com, and you spell truelock, T-R-U-L-O-C-K, truelockchokes.com. Whew, we could go on forever with Rocky Gutierrez. Thank you, Rocky, for joining us. Have a great season. Hopefully, we will talk again very soon on the air and off. Thank you to anybody who's commented at our social media platforms on all the questions I ask. If you have your own, that's a good place to start. To those who left ratings and reviews, sure appreciate the kind words. The entire Upland Nation podcast is made possible by Roughland Performance Kennels, Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Pointer Shotguns, and the new website, PointerShotguns.com. Mid Valley Clays and Shooting School, Ringneck Nation of Huron, South Dakota, and True Lock Chokes. Until I see you in the field, which is very soon, I hope, I hope you join me at the website furfeathersfriends.com and find out how your dog can become an ambassador for newcomers to the hunting fraternity. I'm Scott Linden. Thanks for listening.